let's move into what I hope is a new way of thinking for many of us. It is using the muscle power available, but it is redirecting it actively to the stiffest joint or the joint that needs it the most. It's really very simple. It's using our blocking exercises, but for much longer periods of time. Our traditional treatment, although useful early on and maybe to maintain, still only allows us to focus on one goal at a time. It may contradict the other goals, such as active repatterning or edema reduction. And it focuses only on passive motion. Active redirection is very simple, and it just blocks normal joint motion to redirect the force to the stiffest joint. In this example, with interosseous muscle tightness, it's just redirecting the force to the interphalangeal joint extrinsic flexion to elongate the interosseous muscles. No passive stretching is required. We as therapists already do this frequently. In our fracture bracing, we immobilize joints that are near to the fracture site to direct motion distally to maintain joint motion. We do blocked exercises. We provide exercise equipment and devices. In this case, we're limiting hyperextension of the MP joint. We're redirecting active motion, but an exercise device does it for a short period of time, and once that exercise is completed, there's no carryover into normal active motion. That's the reason that the blocked exercise needs, needs to be prolonged, and we're calling that prolonged blocked exercise active redirection. We direct active motion to where it's needed. Here, we are simply taking a leather loop attached to a string, which is attached to a loop around the wrist that is not allowing MP joint full extension, and it is demanding excursion to the PIP. You can see the PIP extension here, and that it's significantly greater here. As the patient improves, more MP joint extension would be allowed. So active redirection gives you simultaneous goals of active tissue glide, and remember we said differential tissue glide. In other words, not only is the PIP joint extending, but it's also flexing. There's differential movement one direction, and then returning, there's differential movement the other direction. And there is absolutely no passive range of motion. This active redirection allows cortical repatterning, so the patient relearns to actually move the stiff joint instead of to avoid it. and the active movement is pumping the lymphatic system to reduce digital edema. To me, the most positive aspect of the active redirection concept is the fact that all of these goals are being met simultaneously. Let's look at this schematic drawing to see if this helps us conceptualize this. Here is the direction of flexion, and here's the direction of extension. Imagine this is your, we could say this is bone, and this is an overlying tendon, just for simplicity. So tendon on bone. It's adherent. The adherence limits motion. We apply an orthosis, pushing the finger into extension, and with that, we move the adherence in one direction. It allows that kind of motion. But by pushing it in that direction, we are also holding it still, which means there's no pumping mechanism. There's no differential movement. We still are looking at our adherence now with the same model. But now we have active redirection. So we're going this way for extension, this way for flexion. So the actual range of motion 
has been increased in both directions, as has the differential glide, as well as the pumping, as well as the experience of active motion in two opposing directions. So if we look at the passive motion, there's this much that's gained. Very hard to maintain, perhaps, because there's been no differential glide. But with active redirection, we have two motions of direction that are being gained simultaneously without canceling out the other. So active redirection can be used in a number of ways. In my opinion, the small orthosis for fingers can be very easily used for relatively acute inflexibility. Other approaches may work, but this is such a simple approach that I think once you try it, it may be your approach of choice. It's worn during waking hours so that it's always redirecting active motion. It's not an exercise orthosis. It's an orthosis to wear full time during the waking hours so that the joint needing the motion is always moving. This example you're looking at is blocking metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion of the long finger and driving flexion to the PIP joint. Casting motion to mobilize stiffness, or called SIMS, is a treatment approach that I developed, but it is for much more chronic stiffness. It works because it's non-removable. The reason it's non-removable is this is a very chronic pattern of motion that has been imprinted in the motor cortex, and the only way to change that effectively is a longer period of time with the loose joints blocked and the stiff joints actively moving so that the muscles that activate that motion renew their representation in the motor cortex. It's still active redirection, but it's a question of chronicity and how long and whether or not being able to remove it is advantageous. This course does not go into depth on this treatment approach. You can find an explanation of this approach in the most recent chapter on treatment of the stiff hand in rehabilitation of the hand and upper extremity. You can access a copy of this chapter on our website. When should you use active redirection? Well, when increased motion is needed at one joint, it is the ideal choice. You simply construct a device that directs motion to that one joint. When would you use the non-removable SIMS cast? I, it would absolutely be my first choice when there's prolonged stiffness of multiple joints. And I would also say that it often is a solution when nothing else is working. So if we compare our passive orthosis, what do we get from a passive orthosis? We get one direction no cortical connection, and we may increase inflammation or edema. It depends on the construct, the length of time, the amount of force, a number of variables, but that is possible. With active redirection, we get differential glide in both directions, cortical remapping, bringing alive the muscles that have been suppressed by the maladaptive pattern, and this normal balanced motion reduces edema and decreases inflammation. It allows the rebalancing to occur naturally. Let's take a look in a bit more depth at the active redirection and how to apply it to the PIP joint. As we said previously, MP joint hyperextension is one of the biggest contributors to the inability to fully extend the PIP joint. So controlling the MP joint is indeed the goal of active redirection, whether you want to gain extension or flexion. Let's take a look at the concept of how this would work. We're going to use a pencil to demonstrate the basic principle of redirecting motion to the PIP joint. 
Let's first imagine that we will take the long finger and we will place this pencil over the proximal phalanx. Now when this individual flexes and extends, you can see that there's power driven to the PIP joint for extension that is much greater than the other fingers. I want to remind you that relative motion positioning for this purpose works on the long and the ring fingers, but it does not always work so well on the index and little fingers. Let's look at that. If I take this pencil and I do the same thing for the little finger, I want to block it into flexion. That may not work so well because the, whole, the entire hand can rotate and hyperextend and the pencil does not stay in place. However, if I, do the, if I do that and I take the two middle fingers and include the index finger, now I have relatively more control over the little finger and the pencil cannot flip out as easily. This means that when we're making an orthosis to control the MP joint of either the little or the index finger, that we usually have to span across all four fingers. Now the same is true if we're blocking to facilitate PIP flexion. In other words, we want to block the MP joint in extension. So if I put the pencil here on the ring finger, you'll see that interphalangeal joint flexion is actually much greater on that finger than the other fingers, driving the motion for greater flexion. The same would be true if I had the pencil here, but again, if I just put it for the little finger here, we then, oh, sorry, he, okay, if we do it this way, then there's the problem of rotation. So we do indeed usually have to include all four digits if we're trying to control a border digit. Now as we previously said, we can observe that flexion contractors secondary to ulnar palsy can be resolved by the use of an orthosis that blocks metacarpal phalangeal joint hyperextension. And if indeed that works in individuals with ulnar palsy, there is no reason the same orthosis or a different orthosis can you be used to gain PIP extension for all the digits. Recently, we have come to appreciate that a superb way to manage many extensor tendon injuries is the use of what is called an immediate controlled active motion orthosis. This is called a relative motion orthosis, a, a yoke splint, a merit orthosis. It, ha it has a number of names. But I do not want you to be confused. The configuration of the orthosis that we will make to redirect motion to the PIP joint looks very similar to this, but the goals are different. Here we see an orthosis that is blocking the MP joint of the little finger from full extension and driving to the PIP, and here we see the same concept but for the ring finger. This one actually goes across and includes the index finger. We'll look at that as well. So let's look at a video with this in place to see how the dynamics work. And fully flex and the PIP joint flexion is not impeded. So let's take a look at the palm to make sure that that's the back. And indeed, PIP flexion is not limited. In addition to the evaluations we previously discussed about determining whether it's joint um, extrinsic tightness, intrinsic tightness. It's also helpful to think about the PIP joint specifically and what is driving extension. The most common limitation actively of PIP joint extension is the inability of full proximal glide of the dorsal apparatus, or in other words, adherence of the dorsal apparatus so that it cannot glide proximally. So the majority of what we do to increase PIP joint motion actively is to assure 
better proximal glide of the dorsal apparatus. However, in the finger that has sustained a boutonniere injury, and that boutonniere has been already treated, I want to be clear, it's not an acute boutonniere, but if the boutonniere has already been treated and following removal of the immobilization, it's still difficult for the patient to get full PIP extension and there tends to be some hyperextension of the DIP joint, we can help with PIP joint extension by using another approach. So in my mind, when I'm looking at digital motion and limitation of PIP joint motion, I'm determining which of these two is the primary cause. It's rarely both being the same. I guess it's possible, but it's usually one or the other. If it's limited proximal glide of the dorsal apparatus, we block that MP joint inflection and we drive the extensor digitorum communist power into the dorsal apparatus. We don't let the EDC extend the MP joint. We take this extrinsic muscle power, which is a, remember, it's a larger muscle with more power and more excursion, and we now are driving it out into the finger for full interphalangeal joint extension. However, if the patient has had a boutonniere injury and is experiencing difficulty with full PIP extension and there's a tendency to DIP hyperextension, a small, a small molded orthosis taped on, which still allows flexion, blocks the DIP joint inflection that increases the tension of the lateral band, and they then, because they have more tension in them, they better participate in PIP joint extension. So we're demanding an alteration of the balance of power at the PIP joint by doing this. We're recruiting the lateral bands. The patient still is able to fully flex the DIP joint, and here we dramatically see the difference without an orthosis and with an orthosis, a dramatic reduction. This splint would be worn full time during the day, but over time the angle of flexion would be decreased as the PIP joint extension was maintained. First, we'd like to see full PIP joint extension before we change and lessen this angle. But slowly over time, we would bring the DIP joint into neutral as motion is maintained. Mm -hmm.